We have traveled all over Kenya and East Africa to find hard-working farmers. We want to celebrate them while giving them the knowledge they need to improve their farms, get better yields, and become profitable farmers. We will see how farmers across the region can learn from experts and from each other in every way. Join us and our experts on this journey. And share their family's experiences as they make these changes. <laughs> Karibu to the Shamba Shape Up Safari. In the last couple of weeks, we had an opportunity to visit some of the farmers in different regions. We also gave them a chance to get in touch with us using our mobile service, I Shamba. Uh, so Tony, I think we should go and visit some of the farmers we visited before and see how they're shaping up. Oh, good idea, Naomi. I think I'll go to Kajedo County. Uh -huh. And I'll go all the way to Bomet County. Okay, so good luck. Good luck, Naomi. Do you remember Peter and Ruth in Bomet County? If the cows have enough food, they can produce more milk. But feeding the cows well isn't all. We need to know how to get rid of all the ticks these cows have. Ruth and Peter here have a nice cow shed, as you can see, but they're not happy. Uh, I've inspected your cow shed and uh, I can say you've done some work. But uh, there are some questions I would like to ask maybe that will help me to understand more of the challenges you are going through currently. First, I would like to understand how much milk will you usually get per day from the three cows we've seen. 18 liters of milk per day. 18 liters per day from the three cows. Yeah. So that comes to uh, an average of like six, six, six liters per cow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to know how frequently do you do your spraying on your animals? We normally spray uh, twice per month. That means after two weeks, oh, we twice spray. Per month. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you talk of um, profitability of the farm, there are some things we look at. Uh, we have to look at like four aspects. That is one, tick control, worm control, nutrition, and the general management of your animals. If you talk of six liters per cow per day, under natural circumstances, a cow is supposed to produce not less than five liters under natural pasture without any supplementation. That means you are actually underproducing. You are not actually producing as the, uh, to the expected levels. And I've already inspected your animals. I found that they have some uh, ticks. Ticks are actually one of the problems you are looking at farms. If you look at tick infestation currently, it's so high. And uh, most of the farmers are actually having a lot of challenges dealing with ticks. And uh, we look at how we are going to help and control those ticks. Because um, if you talk of two weeks, there's a problem also. We are supposed to do it on a weekly basis. After seven days, you, you, you need to repeat again and spray properly. Uh, also, I've looked at your water trough. Your water trough is not actually in a very good condition. Yes, you've tried and uh, you have a good uh, structure. You need to actually clean it at least every three days. You empty the trough and put in clean water so that you reduce chances of your animals getting infection from the water. So we need actually to solve those and uh, you will be back to like produce more milk per day. Now it's time to spray the cows. All those wear protective clothing to do this. Use 20 milliliters of grenade in 20 liters of water in a knapsack and mix well. Start at the tail of the cow moving towards the head, spraying the legs, tail, udder, body, neck and face. Make sure you get the underside of the cow too. You need to spray the cows every seven days. Shamba Shape Up are back to see how they have been shaping up since the last time we visited them. Peter and Ruth, we are very happy to be back here again. Are you happy to see us? We are very, very happy. How has it been since we uh, last left here? Uh, since we got uh, learning from the experts, mm -hmm. from the coopers, mm -hmm. our dairy cows are now doing good. You know, at first I used to spray these cows after every two weeks. Now that I've learned that I'm supposed to be spraying after every one week, I follow that. And I've seen some changes. There are no ticks. I can see that they are ticks free. How about feeding the cows? Uh, you know, Tony, I used to feed these cows with pomans, media grass, and uh, maize stock. Since I was told to use these supplements, I have used them and I have seen some quite changes. Mm. So, so how are the cows now? As you can see, they are very nice. Unlike the other time, uh, when they were only using these uh, media grass and the mist. 
Uh, yeah. What other changes have you made? Uh, Tony, uh, I used to train this water here after every one week. Since I got the business of advice from the experts, from the coopers, they told me to be actually draining this water after every three days. So I've done and I've seen some good work there. Tell me about milk production. The production of milk has actually increased. Uh -huh. Yeah, I used to milk, or we used to milk uh, six liters of milk. But since then, we are now getting a, a, at least 10 liters per cow. That's, that that's means good. So your cows are good? They are good. Anything else you can tell us about your cows right now? They are now in calf. Ah, that's yeah. good Yeah, that's now we are expecting to be calving down after, after four months. You've really improved, Peter. Yeah. Well done. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow! Peter and Ruth are doing such a good job on their cows that we decided to get him and his neighbors an expert to teach them more on how to increase fodder for their cows. Peter, what do you usually feed your cows on? I normally or usually feed my dairy cows with navia grass and the pomerods. Mm -hmm. At uh, times I can use uh, green maize. Evelyn, you've heard from the farmer. What else should a farmer feed his cows on? Cows require protein. For Peter to give a protein to his cows, he needs to feed the, them with the fodder shrub, known as Kaliandra. So farmers, do you have any questions? One question. <laughs> uh, this Kaliandra is an extra feed that you've just said. How do we plant and where? We normally encourage farmers to raise the seeds in a nursery before planting out on their farms. There are various areas where you can plant your Kaliandra so that uh, you don't uh, occupy space that is meant for your crops. You can plant your Kaliandra along uh, soil conservation structures. Some of you have uh, terraces. You can plant the Kaliandra along the terraces. Uh, you can also plant uh, Kaliandra along uh, internal and external boundaries on your farm. If you have uh, Napier, you can also mix Kaliandra with Napier. What we recommend that uh, if you decide to mix Kaliandra with Napier, you plant one row of Kaliandra followed by two rows of uh, Napier. Fodder shrubs are not difficult to grow and don't have to compete with your crops for space. You can grow these shrubs along the boundaries in your shamba. If your farm is on a slope, you can grow the shrubs along the edges of your terraces to hold the terraces together. This helps to stop soil erosion protect watersheds, and give you firewood. How long does it take to grow? Kaliandra seed has a very hard seed coat. And in order to increase the germination, it's very, very important that you soak the seeds in uh, water for two days or 48 hours so that you can soften the seed coat. The same way you soak uh, beans when you want to cook them but uh, Kaliandra uh, seeds are soaked much longer than the beans. Once the seed coat is softened, then you can sow your Kaliandra seeds immediately. When you sow Kaliandra seeds in the nursery, it takes about four months before it is ready for planting on your farm. So before you even uh, establish your nursery, it is very, very important to plan so that uh, when the Kaliandra seedlings are ready, the rains are also available. After planting this Kaliandra, how long will it take for you to renew it? We normally recommend that uh, a farmer plants 500 Kaliandra per cow. If you have one cow, you plant 500 Kaliandra. If you have two cows, you plant 1,000. The 500 Kaliandra shrubs will be able to take you a whole year. And uh, you can be cutting for several years without Kaliandra drying up. Now, before we go to the nursery, Peter, I'm sure you have a question. Now, after planting this Kaliantra, how can I manage? Will I leave it to get to its height or I can prune it? Kaliandra has many uses. But as a farmer, if you choose to grow Kaliandra for livestock, as a fodder, you have to cut it at uh, a certain height, above ground, maybe 0.5 meters, so you can maintain it at this height from the ground. 
You don't have to let it to grow into a big tree. What is the importance of doing that? The importance of uh, cutting it back is for it to increase the herbage, the foliage. Because if you let it grow into a tall tree, the amount of biomass that it produces is not much. And also there's also the danger of falling if you have to climb a tree. But if you maintain it at that height, it's easier to manage. Ah, no, I think it's good if we go to the nursery and show us how to plant. <coughs> Caliandra seeds have a hard coat, so they will take a long time to germinate if you do not treat them. To treat the seeds, you need to soak them for two days in water. When most of the seeds have swollen, they can be planted. Plant the seeds straight after you have soaked them. And remember, do not boil the seeds. When you make a nursery bed, make sure you'll be able to water it every day. First, lay a sheet of plastic one meter wide onto the ground where you want to make the nursery bed. This will stop the seedlings roots going too deep into the soil. Then, make a raised seed bed 10 to 15 centimeters high and then level the soil. The seed bed should be one meter or three feet wide. Support the sides of the bed with materials like banana stems, timber or stones and prop them firmly with wooden pegs or stones. Make furrows 10 centimeters apart and two centimeters deep. How many seeds per hole? You need to sow two seeds per hole. In the prepared furrows, plant two seeds in each space with five centimeters between each set of seeds. You can use a stick cut to five centimeters to measure each space. Then cover the seeds lightly with soil. Cover the nursery bed with mulch. Water the seed bed every day. After the seeds sprout, take away the mulch and make a raised shade over the seed bed to protect the seedlings. Transplant the seedlings after four months when they are about one foot tall. To transplant seedlings, remember to take off the plastic before planting if you have grown them in bags. Always transplant seedlings with some soil attached to their roots. This will help them to survive. Plant seedlings in one line, 50 centimeters apart. Plant the seedlings upright in their holes and fill the space around them with a mixture of topsoil and manure. Step on the soil around the seedling to make the seedling firm. Water the seedlings every day to make sure they all live. Now you have learned all this. What if we forget? Oh, we have a service called iShamba. Do you all have your phones? Good, take out your phones. Now I want you to text the word JOIN and send it to 21606 and you'll get connected to an expert to grow good, good fodder crops for your cows and also other information you might need about your farm. How does that sound? Good! And that was not all. Evelyn, our fodder expert, decided to take us to a very successful dairy farmer nearby who was using Caliandra for her cows. While we were on our way there, it's time for a break. Welcome back to Shamba Shape Up. We are in Bomnet, visiting Ruth and Peter and learning about growing Caliandra to use as fodder for cows. We have come to meet Rose, who has been farming cows and growing Caliandra for a number of years. So Rose, how long have you been farming? I've been farming for the last uh, 10 years. Yes. But uh, I was farming the ordinary way, our way, Kalenjin way. You know, as Kalenjins, we keep cows. So for the last, now, six years is when I've known uh, the techniques of uh, farming, especially in dairy. Rose explains to us why she grows Kaliandra for her cows. Now, after feeding your cows the uh, Kaliandra, is there any change and improvement? Yes, there is a uh, great change. How? Because uh, the milk pro production has increased. Uh, drastically. So you would encourage farmers to grow Caliandra? Yes. Good. Yes. So our farmers, any questions? What are the advantages of growing this uh, Caliandra in your farm? 
Taliantra is good for environment conservation and also for um, our cows because um, without protein feeds in our cows we cannot produce the right um, kilos of milk. Since I, I started using, I've seen the difference. I want to ask uh, Rose, uh, when he, she harvests this Kaliandra, how do you give to your cows? I harvest uh, a day earlier and then I leave to wilt. The following day now I, I mix with the, the, the feeds and then I, I, I give to the cow. Evelyn, so the most important thing is to keep them to wilt. Yes. For a day. Yes. Okay. When you harvest them, are you going to make into pieces or you just give? Yes, I try to have a shaf cutter. I cut with the shaf cutter. Earlier on, I was using a punk before I, 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 I got the, the shaf cutter. What are some of the management practices that you normally carry on on your Kaliandra? The management of Kaliandra is so easy. At times, there is uh, grass coming inside the Kaliandra. The time I cut, I can blow. Suppose you have excess of uh, this Kaliandra, which exceeds the, the number of animals that you have. How do you normally uh, preserve for future use? I cut at once, and then I take to a shed to keep them dry, and then I keep them in the, in the box for future use. It can stay even over three months. I think now, Rose, you need to show us how to prune the Kaliandra. Okay. Good. I can show you. Okay. Kaliandra is a good source of protein for your cows, goats, and sheep. You will need about 500 shrubs to feed one cow throughout the year. Kaliandra is ready to harvest 9 to 12 months after planting. It is possible to have 4 to 6 harvests per year. To harvest, cut leaves and young branches when they're about 5 feet long. The leaves should be dried under shade for one day and then mixed with other fodder like lepia grass and then fed to the animals. After about 12 years, you should dig up the plants and plant new seedlings. Wow, we've learned so much here in Bomet with Peter and Ruth. Their cows are doing so well. Their milk production is way, way up. And now, it should go up even more if they start using Kaliandra. I wonder how Naomi is getting on in Matasi, Kajiado County. I'm back to see Dorothy. Do you remember her? Dorothy, it's really nice to see you again since the last time we were here. But tell me, what did you learn last time we were here? Last time we were here, I learned so much. Because I learned about the chickens, the cows, the shamba, mm -hmm. and I've improved quite a bit on them. So tell us how you improve with the, with the cows. The cow improved, although I lost one last year. Oh, you did? Yeah, I did lose one. Which one? The one that was pregnant. The pregnant one? Yeah. So what happened? Just one morning we woke up, it, didn't, it was not able to wake up to and feed. We called a vet, he came, he injected it, it with some med, meds, mm -hmm. and nothing, it didn't, there was no change. Mm -hmm. Eventually it died. Oh, I'm very sorry about that. It's okay. But okay, fine, so what about the, these ones? How are they doing? These ones, they're doing quite well. Mm -hmm. The milk production, it went up, up a bit. Oh, it did? Yeah, it, it changed, it's changed. To how much? When they were the two of both of them, I was getting three liters. Yeah. But now with that one, I'm getting five liters in the morning, four liters in the evening. Right. Yeah, that's a great improvement. It is a great improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what else did you improve on? I improved on the feeding. Uh -huh. The Napier grass, Kitambo, I used to bring it, then I feed it them directly. Uh -huh. But when the Cooper's guy came, he told me I should cut the Napier grass, make it dry for the whole day, then I feed it the following day. Mm -hmm. So that's what I normally do nowadays. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's very good. Uh -huh. And supplements? The supplements, nowadays when I'm milking the cow, I give it Maklik, the, the mineral market. that yes. he gave me. I bought the and I'm giving it now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, and you're very happy about that? Yeah, I'm very happy because that's what made the cow improve in the production of milk. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, and I'm really sorry about your, the, the cow. I mean, that's a big loss, yeah? It was a I big have, shock. I have some good news for you. Not uh -huh. all is lost, right? Uh -huh. So. We have a, uh, a service called Aishamba. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's check this out. Okay. Yeah. I showed Dorothy how to subscribe to Aishamba by sending join to 21606. When she is subscribed, 
She'll be able to call a vet or a crop expert anytime she has a problem. She might even be able to save her cow next time. Yes, so you'd see the cow immediately, you'd have called. Yeah. Yeah, you'd have known what the problem was. Uh -huh. Even as a progression of, of uh -huh. the pregnancy or, or in the, the, the cow being in calf, uh -huh. that would have really helped. Uh -huh. There are so many fake chemicals these days, and we have shown Dorothy how to avoid them to save herself money and stress. There are always pests and diseases to look out for. We all use agrochemicals to try to control these problems, but we need to make sure we are buying the right thing from the right place. The Agrochemicals Association has come to help Dorothy avoid fake agrochemicals. The AAK is a group of all the pest control product suppliers in the country. Our main objective of being together is to assist our farmers to get genuine products. Mm -hmm. All members of the industry must meet the requirements of the law. And the law we follow is Pest Control Products Act. Let's go down to the farmers like Dorothy here. How yeah. can Dorothy be able to detect genuine products? We ask them to look for that clean supply chain, which starts from manufacturer, comes to distributors, who are mostly our members, mm -hmm. then it goes to agrovet outlets. So now, what steps should Dorothy here take when getting her products to use in the farm? So where do you buy, you buy your fungicides and insecticides from? I go to a grow chem, chemist. Mm -hmm. When somebody comes to your farm to sell to you, you should ask him whether it's accredited mm -hmm. to the industry mm -hmm. and to PCPV. Mm -hmm. Anyone who is accredited by the industry will have an identity card, which they should carry with them at all times. I see farmers buying from uh, hawkers in a van or in a, in a car, you know, car is opened and they're selling chemicals. Yeah. Are, are they also accredited? They Should not. the farmer also ask for an ID from them? Yes, those are the counterfeiters. <laughs> those are the counterfeiters. Those who come actually without branded vehicles. Mm -hmm. The branded vehicles are no problem. Mm -hmm. Those are with the dresses and all that. Yeah. Those who come without branded vehicles, mm -hmm. those are the ones who sell counterfeit products. And normally when they are selling to you, they are really always in a hurry. You find them at marketplaces, they open their boot, they sell. Those are the counterfeiters. Yeah, so Dorothy, last time we learned something about chemicals. Do you remember? Yeah, I do remember. Mm -hmm. I was taught on how to handle chemicals. Yes. When I go to the agrofed, what I should look at, where are the label. Yes. And of late, I've been quite busy because mm -hmm. I've been dealing with my cows and the, the chickens. Right. So my dad is the one who is in charge with the shamba and dealing with the chemicals. Mm -hmm. But I would be glad if he's the one that you would show him on what to look at. Oh, fantastic. You'd love him to learn. Yeah, I would. Aha, so I have an expert uh -huh. who will teach you about handling chemicals. Okay. Yeah, we can both go together, okay. you and your father. Uh -huh. Would you like that? Very much. Okay, let's go then. That was all. Okay. All right. So we took Dorothy and her father to the nearby Ngong town to meet with a crop life expert. Mr. Shoma, whenever you come to an agrovet like this one, what do you check out for? The first thing I check out for is to see whether the agrovet is licensed to sell the goods that it puts on the counter. Mm -hmm. Whether we have the test and control board license. Is there anything else to check? If it's a pesticide that I am buying, I look for the label of the AAK to find out whether it really is genuine and that they are selling us the right products. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that wrong? There's nothing else I check. <laughs> Mr. Expert, does he, is that correct? Yeah, actually, Mr. Shoma is correct. Uh -huh. And I'd like to say that I, I like what he said. The first thing he checks is whether the shop is licensed. Mm -hmm. That shows that that shop has been visited by pest control officers. Mm -hmm. and they have inspected it and given it a clean bill of health. Right. So most likely you'll not find any bad pesticide in that shop. Mm -hmm. The other thing he says is that he checks on the mark of quality. Right. All the pesticides have got a mark of quality. Can I have one? He checks the AAK mark of quality. But I would also la like to add that you should also check on the PCPB number. Mm -hmm. The all pesticides that we register, we give them a specific number for each specific pesticide. This shows that this pesticide has been registered for use in Kenya. So Mr. Shoma is right. And the other thing I'd like to advise Mr. Shoma is before you buy any pesticide, please know your problem. Pesticides are expensive, and if you don't know your problem, you might waste your money. Mm -hmm. So first know your problem, and if you don't know your problem, please ask an expert to tell you your problem so that you get the right pesticide for the right 
uh, problems so that you can solve your problems. In addition to Ganashoma, I would like to add is that when you are buying your pesticides, make sure you get a receipt for the pesticides you have bought. One thing, any shop owner who gives you a receipt shows that he is somebody who can be trusted. And then the second thing, which is also very important, it will show that if there is a problem with that pesticide, we as a government, as pest control product board, we shall be able to follow it up and be able to see what went wrong and if any action is to be taken, we shall be able to take. But without a receipt, it will be very difficult for us to follow that. So make sure you always have your receipt and keep it safely until you have used your pesticide. Uh, so Mr. Shema, do you have any questions so far? Some time ago, the pesticides that we used to get from agrochemicals were a broad spectrum in a way that they would kill or they would control pests like amphibs, the white fly, and, um, and many others. What has happened that nowadays you got to go for a particular pesticide or a particular pest, making it very expensive for the family. Nowadays we are not registering products for broad spectrum. We want to register a pesticide for a specific one. Before they were used to be registered for so many diseases and pests, and we came to find out that sometimes they are not working for all of them. So nowadays we are doing tests for, per plant or per disease, so that we are sure that that one works. And that thing I would want to advise you that pesticides are expensive. Please read the label. And if you put one shilling in the, in the, in the farm through pesticides, it should get you five shillings out if you use it correctly. We visited the Pest Control Board, PCPB, who worked together with the Agrochemical Associates of Kenya, AAK, to talk with Mr. Kuria Gatonye about how they can help farmers identify original products and help protect crops and livelihood. PCPs are pest control products. We like to encourage farmers uh, to be on the lookout because it's at the point of uh, manufacture and labeling that the products are tampered with. Put very simply for the understanding of our farmers, it's a counterfeit are products that claim to be what they are not. Even the people who are doing the counterfeiting, what they claim about their products is not correct because they are uh, definitely not the original product. Counterfeits are harmful to the health of farmers. In terms of the farmer is never exactly sure what they are using. Whenever they come into uh, contact with the chemicals, we as uh, the responsible industry have prescribed on the label what they are supposed to do. But when a product is a counterfeit, what is described in the label may not necessarily be describing the antidote for the counterfeit. So we discourage farmers from using counterfeits that they avoid uh, harming their health. The other major impact area of counterfeits is in terms of yield. Because the counterfeits will never be effective, therefore the farmers suffer very he heavy losses in terms of yield because the pests that they are targeting to control are never effectively controlled by counterfeits. It is so good to see our farmers continuing to do so well after their shape up. Dorothy is getting more milk from one cow than she was from two. And she's so busy with her successful chicken business that her father now takes care of the crops. So see you next time on Shamba, Shamba Shape, Shape Up. Up. Shamba Shape Up is online. To learn more about today's topics or to watch any of our previous episodes, visit shambashapeup.com. Select the episode and click play. You could also visit our Facebook page, Shamba Shape Up to get more information, get involved in discussions, and also get a chance to enter some of our great competition to win great prizes. You can also find us on Twitter, at Shamba Shepa, or simply text 30606.